The date is April 4, 1943, and the war in Europe is starting to turn in favor of the Allies. For years, Germany and her Italian allies have maintained an iron grip on Europe, and with the defeat of France early in the war and the expulsion of the British Expeditionary Force at Dunkirk, Europe was effectively in the iron grip of the Axis powers. For the Allies, things look grim. If they are to be victorious, then they must accomplish the daunting task of landing forces in Europe. Yet the Germans have reinforced any possible landing sites, and establishing a foothold in the continent will be a bloody and costly affair. To date, though, Italian forces have performed exceptionally poor in combat against the Allies. On the deserts and plains of northern Africa, the Italians have been all but defeated, and leadership of the few remaining infantry divisions and armored brigades has fallen squarely onto the Germans. Hitler no longer trusts the competency of his Italian allies, and has ordered that the Italian military no longer operate without direct supervision of German commanders. Sensing the weakness of the Italian military, it's decided that the Allies will soon invade Italy itself in order to establish a foothold on the European continent and forced the Germans to divert forces from a second landing site in northern France to Italy. In preparation for the coming operation slated for fall of 1943, the Allies have now begun an extensive bombing campaign against major Italian cities and military facilities. On that fateful April 4th, several squadrons of American and British bombers prepare for a bombing run against Naples, Italy. Escorted the entire way by fighters, Allied bombers nonetheless protect themselves by flying in tight formations that allow each aircraft's gunners to support other friendly aircraft. The airfield at Salute, a small airstrip outside of Benghazi, Libya, only allows a few bombardiers to launch at a time though, and the aircraft are thus launched in waves, with the last waves speeding up to catch with the first waves. Then the entire strike force flies together toward its final destination. One of the last planes in the air is a brand new B-24D Liberator, nicknamed Lady Be Good, which carries a crew of nine American airmen. At the helm of the aircraft is First Lieutenant William J. Hatton, with co-pilot Second Lieutenant Robert F. Toner. The ladies' navigator is Second Lieutenant D.P. Hayes, who sits across from the bombardier Second Lieutenant John S. Rovka. The aircraft's flight engineer, Technical Sergeant Harold H. Ripslinger, sits further back along the fuselage alongside the radio operator, Technical Sergeant Robert E. Lamott. Finally, the aircraft's three gunners, Staff Sergeants Guy E. Shelley, Vernon L. Moore, and Samuel E. Adams, protect the aircraft from the top and the sides. As the Lady climbs into the skies over the Sahara Desert, strong winds have kicked up huge sandstorms, and the visibility is nearly null. With a low flight ceiling, the B-24D Liberators are unable to fly above the worst of the weather, and many of the bombers end up aborting their mission and returning to base. The Lady, however, refuses to turn back, and continues on toward her target in Naples. As she crosses over the Mediterranean, though, the Lady is far behind the remains of the formation which has made it out of the Sahara, and with a faulty automatic direction finder, First Lieutenant Hatton decides to turn the plane around and head for home. As he makes the decision, Lieutenant Hatton radios back to Saluk Airfield and requests assistance, informing command that he's having a hard time navigating in the dark. In order to assist the incoming Lady, soldiers at Saluk shoot up flares into the night sky, but the Lady ultimately overshoots the airfield. With no radio contact, several hours later and long after her fuel supplies would have run out, the Lady and her crew are declared missing in action, and a search for the aircraft is launched. The best that the American Air Force officials can determine is that the Lady crashed somewhere in the Mediterranean, and thus focused their efforts there. Fast forward to November 1958, and British geologists working for the Darcy Oil Company are flying over the Sahara on a surveying mission when they spot the wreckage of a crashed plane. They immediately radio the nearby American Wheelis Air Force Base, but with no record of an American plane having been lost recently in the area, the report is ignored. The same survey team spots the aircraft on numerous follow-on aerial surveys, and finally, a year later, Darcy Oil Company dispatches a ground team to investigate the crash site. Heading the ground team is Darcy supervisor Gordon Bowerman, who happens to be a close friend of Lt. Col. Walter B. Kolbus, commander of Wheelis Air Base. Discovering the plane largely intact, Bowerman collects maintenance inspection records from the aircraft, as well as the names of her missing crew from clothing and other equipment scattered throughout the interior of the aircraft. Upon returning to Wheelis Air Base, Bowerman shows his discovery to Kolbus, who immediately realizes that this must be a lost American aircraft from World War II. A team made up of officials from both Wheelis Air Base and the Army Quartermaster Mortuary in Frankfurt, Germany, immediately conduct an expedition to the crash site hoping to recover the remains of lost American airmen. For three months, the American military investigates the crash site and conducts extensive searches of the surrounding desert, 
Jeeps scour the Saharan plains, while aircraft provide aerial reconnaissance overhead, all hoping to recover the remains of the missing crew. With no parachutes discovered in the wreck, it's believed that the men safely bailed out. But with their crew listed as missing in action for almost two decades, the search teams are now looking for remains they can bring back home to family members. The search crews are also determined to bury their missing comrades from the bygone war with full military honors. After three months of searching, though, the brutal Saharan environment is taking a serious toll on the equipment and men of the search teams both. Ultimately, the search is abandoned, though the teams did manage to recover some of the crew's equipment to include parachutes, flight books, and arrowhead markers, which the crew had used to mark their trail as they made their way across the Sahara. It's decided that the search will be called off, though, due to the probability that the shifting sands have already covered up the remains and for fear of endangering the lives of the men on the search teams. Where the American search teams failed, though, British Petroleum employees would succeed. Just six months later, surveyors from British Petroleum discovered the remains of five crew members and officials from the Army Quartermaster Mortuary returned to Libya to collect the remains. Along with the remains, though, are more personal items to include canteens, flashlights, pieces of parachutes, and flight jackets. A diary belonging to Lt. Robert Toner is also discovered, and its pages are still clearly legible. Within its pages, the young lieutenant chronicles his final days and increasing hopelessness and weakness with his final entry dated Monday the 12th of April 1943. It reads simply, no help yet, and is followed by a few illegible words. The discovery of five of the nine airmen spurs the military to try one more time for the recovery of the last four missing crew members. This final search is codenamed Operation Climax and brings in assets from both the Air Force and the Army. After more months of searching, two more crew members are found, Sergeant Shelley and Sergeant Ripslinger. The search for the last two crew members is regrettably cancelled, the American military having exhausted all options available. In August of 1960, though, British Petroleum employees would find one more crew member, Lt. John Rovka, whom is believed to be the only crewman that did not link up with the rest of the group after bailing out of the aircraft. Sadly, the remains of Sergeant Vernon Moore were never found. The military thus began to reconstruct the events that led to the downing of the Lady Be Good. It's believed that after overshooting her airfield, the Lady began to run out of fuel. Given that the crew was relatively green and had little experience, the malfunctioning direction finder and the fact that it was night spelled disaster for the men. Worse, the pitch black night and the poor visibility led the men to believe that they were flying over the Mediterranean, which explains why they did not attempt to simply land the plane. Instead, all nine men bailed out of the aircraft. Though one of the nine's parachutes failed to open properly and he fell to his death, another man, Lt. Ravka, falls far off course and lands too far away to link up with the rest of the crew. On the ground, seven survivors made their way together northwards, hoping to run into civilization. With only half a canteen of water on each man, though, the five soon became too exhausted to continue and were left behind as the other two pushed on, hoping to find rescue for those that they had to leave behind. The desert would claim them all, though incredibly Sergeant Ripslinger's remains would be found a whopping 200 miles away from the crash site. The inspection of the plane's wreckage would find that it was stocked with several supplies, to include rations and water. The radio is also found to be in working condition, and it's believed that if the men had remained with their aircraft, they could have very well survived the ordeal. However, believing that they were flying over the Mediterranean, not over the flat plains of the Sahara, the men made the fatal decision to bail out a mistake which would cost them all their lives. What would you have done if you were stuck in the middle of the desert with no food and little water? Let us know in the comments, and as always, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more great content.